forces in the church right now uh, don't want the truth of the gospel. They want it changed. They want it ignored. They want to be rid of the truth that is gloriously not going to go away. Hey, my dear friends, this is a historic interview. This is the interview only six hours after the removal by Pope Francis of Bishop Joseph Strickland, America's bishop, from his diocese of Tyler, Texas. Bishop Strickland is one of those bishops who believes, as did the early church, you are married to your diocese. So it's very much like ripping a man away from his family. And his family in Tyler, Texas, no doubt feel that same reality, that same horror. And while it is a grave sadness for them, the bishop is at peace and he's praying for his diocese, he's praying for his people. This is a historic moment in the church. At LifeSite News, we are so honored to bring this to you. Please stay tuned to this episode of the John Henry Weston Show with Bishop Joseph Strickland. Bishop Strickland, welcome to the program. Thanks, John Henry. If you could lead us, uh, as we always begin with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. So, Bishop Strickland, we are here now just about six hours after you um, were officially removed by Pope Francis from uh, the diocese. Can you give us your first reactions? Well, it is um, a sad day for me, but... I'm strong in the Lord. Uh, these two images behind me, the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, those pillars of the church in this time are have been, as I've said in many different ways, the, the pillars of strength for me, hopefully the pillars of strength for all of us. Uh, I encourage uh, myself and others to, to go more deeply than ever into prayer to pray for Pope Francis, to pray for the church, to pray for our world. Certainly, I appreciate the prayers and I need them. And to pray for the Diocese of Tyler, the many people whose lives are disrupted by this. Um, but we move forward, uh, hopefully, and it's my prayer that we're closer to the Sacred Heart of Christ than ever through this. I urge people not to feel like they can walk away from the church. We, we are one body. We are the mystical body of Christ. That is the church. So that, those are my thoughts among many others, but those are the essential thoughts that we continue in faith. We walk forward in faith. Yes, for me personally, it's a, a storm. Um, I can't pretend that it's not. Uh, lots of questions, lots of, uh, empty calendar that will be, I'm sure, filled in different ways, but I rejoice to remain a successor of the apostles as in all reality, um, I, I need to be humble and I, I try to approach that with humility. St. John the Baptist has always been a model for me. The Lord must increase and we must decrease. And, uh, so I, I really hope and pray through all of this that that, that takes on a, a deeper meaning in my life. And I would hope that for all of us. It's not just for bishops that we imitate the great John the Baptist, but it's really for discipleship. We point to the Lord. It's always the Lord. That's why the Blessed Virgin Mary is so important to us in our Catholic family, because as a loving mother, as the mother of the church, she always points to her son, who ultimately points to God the Father and says, follow me to him. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. All of those true realities that resonate through the ages are as true as ever, and we need to be strong and joyful and hopeful in all of that, praying hard, uh, praying harder than ever, in praying that anyone who is upset, angry, confused, whatever the negative emotions, that they move past that to the knowledge that Jesus Christ is truth incarnate, 
We rejoice to know him. We rejoice to share him. Beautiful. Wanted to assure you right away, there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people praying for you already. Um, we started a prayer petition for you, and I think uh, just a few hours ago when I looked, it already had 14,000 signatures. You are very, very loved. Um, and a lot of people who love you are going to be wondering right now um, what this means for you in terms of your living, uh, in terms of your ability to minister as a prelate. Do you do you know what you know this entails for you in terms of where you're going to live, what you're going to do type of thing? Well, um, John Henry, as you ask the answers to questions, uh, I don't have the answers right now. Um, maybe uh, it sounds a little pietistic, but I, I believe it is simply the reality. I'm in the hands of the Lord, as we all are. None of us truly knows what tomorrow holds, and I'm able to go through this as an opportunity to really know <laughs> that I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know that the Lord is with me. I know the power of his love. I feel the power of that prayer that you've mentioned. And certainly I, I remain a bishop and a successor of the apostles. Um, I encourage people, um, as I heard recently, Bishop Athanasius Schneider urging people to pray more deeply than ever for Pope Francis for the Vatican hierarchy, all of them, all of those who are have the tremendous responsibility of guiding the church in these days. Uh, I appreciate the prayers for me, but please include prayers, especially for Pope Francis, the, the Roman pontiff. Um, he needs our prayers. I know that we all get frustrated, we all get confused, sometimes angry, but um, please turn that to prayer and to intercession, especially that the Immaculate Virgin Mary, uh, our most powerful intercessor, the mother of the Son of God, the love between the Immaculate Heart and the Sacred Heart is a love beyond imagining. And so we want to remember that and, and pray that Pope Francis can be more and more deeply embraced by the wonder of that love. Um, I feel that, I, I truly do. I've said many times, I've never experienced the, the blessing of, of an apparition or an allocution or anything supernatural in that sense. But I have been blessed with deep prayer, the rosary and Eucharistic adoration the two pillars of prayer that are the pillars that are behind me, the pillars of St. John Bosco's vision, the Immaculate Virgin Mary and our Eucharistic Lord. Uh, I am blessed to know those pillars in a very personal way. The rosary has taken on a life for me that is just amazing. Truly, I don't have the words. And the same for our Eucharistic Lord really present. We know we're living through a time of questions and confusions in faith and many people walking away, many Catholics saying, oh, they don't really believe these things anymore. And to many of those in high places in the church, at least they're acting as if they don't really know the Lord. They don't really know his mother. And because we know that, let us take on the charitable work of praying for the confused praying for those who have turned their backs on the realities, the challenging realities of our faith. But all of that to say, I don't have answers for exactly how this works, but um, I know that I will bow to another taking the reins of first as administrator and then a new bishop being named to shepherd the Diocese of Tyler. I said that I, I couldn't resign. I couldn't, of my will, uh, abandon the flock that I've been given. But now that an authority, Pope Francis, has the authority to remove me as bishop, and he's chosen to do so, I have to respect that. Um, and so I am no longer Bishop of Tyler, 
And that, I have to unpack that honestly myself and sort of regroup for who I am as a successor of the apostles without a local diocese to care for. But because I love the Lord, I love our Catholic faith, I love every aspect of the faith and want to support the, the Petrine office, the College of Cardinals, the College of Bishops, all the priests and deacons, and the faithful, the real body of the church, the living stones, people of faith, that I've encountered during these past years as a bishop in beautiful ways, in all kinds of different situations. So I guess I would conclude this answer gets a little verbose, I guess, but um, all of us have many questions in our lives, but the answer is we are in the hands of God. We are the Lord's. The church is his. We trust in that. We're strengthened by that. We're guided through the darkness in his light. We will pray this weekend, once again, in the Sunday masses, when we pray the creed, light from light. Jesus Christ is light from light. No matter the darkness, he is light. Let us follow him. Viva Cristo Rey. So one of the main questions that, uh, that people are having right now is why? Why would this happen when there is Father Rupnik, who just got the, the sexual abuser priest with all sorts of nuns begging for uh, redress of their abuse that they suffered. He's put into a diocese, no real sanctions. You have Cardinal Daniels, you have Cardinal Casper, you have all of these cardinals known to be unfaithful in so many ways. Yet there's no sanction there. But here you are, a faithful Catholic disciple of the Lord, apostle of the Lord, one of the successors of the apostles. And by the way, if you were to guess which one it would be, I would always say you're the successor of John because you hold your head to his heart more than anyone I've ever seen. But do you have any idea as to why this was done? Well, John Henry, um, the only answer I have to that is because forces in the church right now uh, don't want the truth of the gospel. They want it changed. They want it ignored. They want to be rid of the truth that is gloriously not going to go away. The truth that is Jesus Christ, his mystical body, which is the church. All the wonders that the martyrs died for and the saints lived for through almost 2,000 years since Christ died and rose. So, and, and again, um, certainly Pope Francis has the responsibility of making the Supreme Pontiff decisions. He has, he's the only one with that authority. But there are many forces working at him and influencing him to, to make these kinds of decisions. So I know it becomes frustrating, um, but we, that's why we pray for the Pope, for him as a son of God, and for his role as the Supreme Pontiff. But we have to acknowledge there are tremendous and powerful forces at work in the world. St. Paul reminds us that we're not fighting against human beings, flesh and blood. We're fighting the powers and principalities of evil. And that's a pretty strong statement, but I believe it's true, it's real. And evil doesn't want the truth of Jesus Christ. Why did ancient Rome crucify him? Because they didn't want the truth that he was proclaiming. They saw it as disruptive. They saw it as questioning and threatening their power. It saw, they saw it in, in all the ways that people sadly see it today and even within the church and the great mystery of our time there are people in the church rather than glorying in the truth of christ they want to delete significant portions of sacred scripture and say oh we got that wrong or we're just going to ignore it um 
saints through 2,000 years didn't get it wrong. Um, doctrine and understanding develops, but it develops in the sense of deepening, not reversing direction. But there are forces um, in the world that want to reverse the direction, want to change moral teachings, want to totally restructure the church. Um, but beautifully, the, the church has functioned with all the human failings. She continues to be here because she is holy, guided by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has fostered basic structures in the church. I would conclude these thoughts by looking to what's happening in Catholic architecture, at least that I've seen recently. Some beautiful churches being built in recent years. When I was in the seminary, they weren't building beautiful churches. They were experimenting with buildings that many of them are being torn down now. I think that's a good metaphor for what is going on in the world. We want to build, or the world wants to build something different. Christ is truth incarnate. He has revealed who we are and what the plan for humanity is. This isn't the first time that the powers that be have wanted to reject that truth. What is troubling and, and, and at least unprecedented as, as I experience it, people from within the church are wanting to change the church and to reject the basic truths. But the answer is to, to stay with it. And frankly, I, I truly believe uh, the Diocese of Tyler that I used to serve a few hours ago blessed with many seminarians, fine young men, strong, that would be wonderful husbands or wonderful spiritual fathers as priests, financially strong, uh, tremendous generosity from the people. I mean, nothing, no place is perfect, no family is perfect, but the diocese is in good shape and some very dedicated people serving in the chancery offices, and the priests serving in the parishes. I'm so proud of the priests in the diocese. So I really can't look to any reason except I've threatened some of the powers that be with the truth of the gospel that will not change, that cannot change. It's perennial, it's everlasting, it's glorious. And if you want it to change, then I'm a problem. And I think that's what, that's the reason. And again, I don't lay it all at the feet of Pope Francis. I mean, he, that's, I mean, I've been a bishop. You have to make decisions. He's the one making the decision. So to me, that calls us to deeply pray for him. He's one man, as I'm one man. None of us has superpowers. We all have the the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide us when we open our hearts to that. But there are forces that we must acknowledge as, as well that are behind this, that are pushing uh, this kind of removal of the bishop for standing with the gospel, as, as you say. I mean, it's very humbling, but a beautiful image that I love to embrace. If I can in any minuscule way stand at the foot of the cross as John the Apostle did, the only one to stand there. I am blessed to have that role as John was. Not an easy role, but a role that says, I'm standing at the cross of truth incarnate. And in many ways, the body of Christ, the mystical body of the church, that is the church, the body of Christ, is going through a passion now the forces of the world in the church and beyond. Many people, we've all read many times people saying, we will finally eliminate the Catholic Church. We just celebrated Pope St. Leo the Great yesterday, and we were reminded in the gospel proclaimed that the gates of hell will not prevail. And so 
when people are pushing a false narrative that looks maybe attractive to many, and it looks like, oh, the church is easing its, its rigid teachings, that, if it's not the truth, is not going to last. And ultimately, it leaves lives and families, societies empty and devastated. And so I have to continue to proclaim the truth with joy and hope, with humor, hopefully, with a, a, a bright outlook, with the light of Christ guiding me. Um, but again, I give long answers, but I think the reason for this is that I threatened too many in, in the power places who want to change the truth. They're never going to accomplish it. Truth doesn't change. The scriptures tell us that. Jesus Christ is the face of truth. He doesn't morph into a different being than he was when he died on the cross and rose for us. He's the same Lord. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And those who want to change that for a day in terms of human history, we have to live through this day, but it's a moment that will pass and the truth will prevail. So Bishop Schneider, in his uh, note about uh, your cancellation, your being removed, your deposition, he says, Bishop Strickland will probably go down in history as an Athanasius of the church in the USA, who, however, unlike St. Athanasius, is not persecuted by the secular power, but incredibly by the Pope himself. It seems that a kind of purge of bishops who are faithful to the immutable Catholic faith and the apostolic discipline, and which has been going on already for some time, has now reached a decisive phase. What are your, what's your take on that? You, you've seen the uh, bishop already removed for having refused to do the vax mandate. You've seen other bishops removed uh, during this time, we saw very early on in this papacy, uh, Cardinal Burke pretty unceremoniously removed as well from various positions that he had no real explanation, just removed. Um, Cardinal Sarah sort of uh, removed in, in some ways, even though he'd reached retirement age, sure, but it was an immediate removal. And there been all sorts of things with regard to what's gone on in this Vatican under Pope Francis that have been very, very disturbing for the faithful. Um, and I know you have a great heart for prayer for the Pope. This is the words that um, Bishop Schneider uses, that he, he says that you and other faithful bishops uh, canceled or, or marginalized in this way should say, and he, this is the quote from him to pray. He says, Holy Father, why are you persecuting? Why are you persecuting and beating us? We tried to do what all holy popes asked us to do. With fraternal love, we offer the sacrifice of this kind of persecution and exile for the salvation of your soul and for the good state of the Holy Roman Church. Indeed, we are your best friends, Most Holy Father. Well, I, I agree with that expression of uh, Bishop Schneider. I heard him. I have great respect for Bishop Schneider and his story to me it, it just resonates with deep faith he grew up in a childhood where um, many people are fearful of maybe returning to something like that in many places in the world where they would look forward to an occasional opportunity to celebrate the mass um, so i have great respect for bishop schneider i mean we have very different backgrounds uh, we're from halfway around the world from each other um, and I would say with regard to Pope Francis that one of the things that Bishop Schneider said that I really embrace is as a bishop, he is our older brother. And so we have an obligation to, to pray for him, to pray for the very best deepening of faith for him. Um, and I know that, you know, I had two older brothers uh, and Sometimes it's tough because, you know, you can have anger, you, all the human emotions, but we need to remember who we are. We are the mystical body of Christ. 
and Pope Francis is the head of this body on earth, representing Christ, serving um, the servant of the servants of God, one of the ancient uh, descriptions of the papacy. So I like that caring for him, praying for him, and that's what I hear in that last expression of Bishop Schneider that you offer, to, to pray for him as an elder brother, um, to, we know the truth. And if there's, there's apparent confusion or a lack of embracing on the, of that truth on the part of an elder brother, we have an obligation out of love uh, to patiently and always respectfully, but clearly with clarity and charity, we need to pray and call elder brothers, younger brothers, everyone in the church, all the mystical body of the church, we all need to be called to a deeper faith, to turn from sin, to turn from any false messages, and to embrace the challenging truth. And so I do urge all of us to, to pray more and more deeply and to, to pray to the Immaculate Virgin Mary and to turn to the Sacred Heart of Christ praying that his mercy may wash over both Francis and the church and the world. It, is, it needs to be noted that the church is going through this tremendous turmoil at a time when the world is also in the midst of two major wars that could become even worse at any moment, many people dying and suffering. So the church in turmoil is not as strong as she should be in bringing the light of Christ to the world. And so we all have the obligation as faithful Catholics, and I again urge people to be more faithful than ever, not allow this to pull them back from living faithfully and vibrantly and joyfully, full of hope, their Catholic faith. And at the heart of that, to pray for the deep abiding conversion of Pope Francis and of all of us to a deeper relationship with the Sacred Heart of Christ. Dear Bishop Strickland, thank you so very much for sharing with us even so few hours after you removed um, your heart and uh, the beauty of your love for the Church, your encouragement for everyone to remain faithful, not to let these times of strife get to them in such a way that move them away from the faith, rather move closer to it, to embrace a life of prayer in a much more earnest way because we recognize that the church is in crisis, um, and, uh, or at least there's a crisis of the pastors of the church, the bishops of the church, the cardinals, and even the pope. And so I want to uh, assure you also, on behalf of the tens of thousands of uh, LifeSite supporters and readers and fans of yours, prayers and thanksgiving and love for you, and also waiting with hearts full of anticipation to see how the Lord uses you as successor of the apostles um, in carrying forward his church to the glory that is to come, to the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. We are, um, as you said, um, we need to be anchored uh, between the two pillars of Don Bosco's dream, uh, between the Holy Eucharist and Our Lady. And you are firmly anchored there. We take your example and uh, we very much look forward to your future, which we know will be bright in whichever way that means. May God bless you and thank you. Thank you. And God bless all of you. We'll see you next time and pray for Bishop Strickland.